a new limited series briefly took the internet by swarm, and the critics love it because it reaffirms their own prejudices. Failing to contribute any meaningful discourse to society, Swarm is yet another serial killer show concerned more with sensationalism than actual substance. No spoilers ahead. I'm Harry, and this is Trash Talk Reverse. Welcome to Trash Talk Reverse, where I trash talk TV shows, or I do the reverse. As mentioned previously, there won't be any spoilers in this discussion, though I will be mentioning things that surround the premise of the show, which don't really spoil anything. That being said, you shouldn't watch this crap anyway. Created by Donald Glover and Janine Neighbors, Swarm spun up a lot of discourse when it came out. It all died down pretty quickly, but I just wanted to point out a couple glaring problems with the show that no one in the media will point out because they're all too bogged down in their own bias and self-righteousness. If you don't already know what this show is about, basically there's this woman who's a super fan of an artist that's like a stand-in for Beyonce. Her foster sister dies, and she goes on this killing spree, killing anyone who's not a super fan of that artist. Like, what? It literally sounds deranged. It's not surprising that critics are loving this, because they like anything that's dark and edgy and seems to criticize an aspect of society, even if that criticism is shallow or completely unserious. Critics and creatives are two legs of the triangle Hollywood runs on, and when they engage in their little validation Olympics, we continue to get crap like this show. There's just too many problems with this show's concept, like I don't even know where to begin, but you know what? Let's start with the villainizing of female fans. This isn't anything new. The media's been harassing and dismissing women for their interests forever. When the Beatles first got popular in the US, it was because of their female fan base. Men were dismissing them as mindless teenage girl crap, and it wasn't until men themselves got into the group that suddenly the Beatles started being taken seriously to the point where now they're considered groundbreaking and classic. Granted, they were all wrong because the music sucked anyway, but this is a trend that followed for decades. When the first Star Trek series came out, their fan base was made of women who would get together and discuss episodes each week. The show was dismissed solely due to its fan base, but then men got into Star Trek, which gave it validation in the eyes of the media, the industry, and society. Think of some of the big franchises or movies you know, stuff like Marvel, DC, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. Although they have fan bases of different genders, they're still subliminally viewed as for guys, the same way stuff like princess movies or teen dramas are viewed as for girls and often regarded as inferior. Whether we admit it or not, everything in our lives is gendered, and it's the same way with music. I remember coming across this old interview from the band Five Seconds of Summer where they were basically boiling down their female fans to groupies. One of them said, we don't want to just be like, for girls, I'm already seeing a few male fans start to pop up, and that's cool. If the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all those guys can do it, we can do it too. Is it not odd to validate your career based on the gender of your fans? I don't really know too much about these guys, but it sure sounds like he's making male fans out to be some sort of achievement that validates their music, while the female fans are there to validate their looks, I guess. Not that there's much there to validate in the first place. But you can see even artists dismiss female fandoms and don't take them seriously. Plenty of people have bad taste, but it's never because of their gender, so why does a male fanbase validate music and shows and sports and movies, but a female fanbase renders it meaningless? Have you ever heard of fanbases being referred to as rabid fangirls, crazy fangirls, hysterical fangirls? Now have you ever heard sports fans, Marvel fans, or even rap fans being characterized this way? So when Swarm comes in with the main character that takes the already exaggerated and gender-specific criticism to a murderous level, you have to wonder how they thought this could possibly contribute to any sort of conversation. There's an assumption with women that having any sort of interest in a music artist or celebrity means you must be this crazy, obsessive weirdo whose life revolves around that person. And sure, there's a lot of people who are actually like that, regardless of gender. But anytime you mention having an interest in literally anything with a predominantly female fan base, the people around you diminish you for it and make assumptions about you. They make this one interest you mentioned into your whole personality, which is what this show does with its main character, directly translating her interest into violence. Meanwhile, it's the male football fans who are getting violent towards their wives over a Super Bowl commercial. Like, what kind of message are y'all trying to send? It's not wrong to be a fan of a person or a piece of media. Fandoms can be great for people looking to bond over similar interests. Now that's not to say fan bases or female fan bases aren't toxic or obsessive, because let's be real, a lot of them definitely are. But of all the types of fans to choose from, Beyonce fans? And in this day and age? If y'all really wanted to get into nasty fandoms, why not Swifties? I've never seen a fandom so inherently racist. I remember how they attacked an actress in the show Ginny and Georgia over a line that goes, you go through men faster than Taylor Swift. She got on Twitter and came after them saying it was sexist and acted super offended, but girl, you purposely crafted an entire career around your exes and made public spectacles of your dating life, and especially the breakups, by creating entire albums about them. So why are you surprised that this would be your legacy? It's not sexist at all. Leonardo DiCaprio gets dragged all the time, rightly so, for having a max age limit of 25. 
But all she needed was this one tweet, because next thing you know, her fans are all up in the show's business harassing the actors. They also continue to go after her exes because she dated them a century ago and can't let it go and still releases songs about them. And this is an intentional marketing tool on her part, creating this girl boss who gets the one up on her exes fake feminist personality that her fans eat up without question. Is this fan base not worth satirizing? And even then, there would have to be nuance on top of that because obviously not all Swifties or all members of any particular fandom are like this. There's also directioners who brag about hacking airport security cameras and dissect non-existent evidence to prove that members of their long disbanded group are dating. Or what about the insane rap fans who got people killed at Astro World? Or fandoms of Selena and Justin and Haley going at it for literal years now over some corny love triangle nonsense? Like, that insanity isn't worth a look? There's so many fans that can be criticized, but your representative psycho fangirl is a black female fan of a black female artist? Really? That's your most likely demographic to commit murder? Because one of the worst parts of the show is it has this whole Fargo type thing where it says based on a true story, but it's not actually based on a true story, but the writers claim they took real life true crime stories. So y'all are pinning these supposed true stories on a fictional killer that represents an already harassed demographic of people. Y'all can make a show about the rabid sports fans who flip over cars and set things on fire, whether their team wins or loses. Sports fans who clear out their schedules for every game, play fantasy football, which hinges on obsessive participation, memorize stats of players which have nothing to do with their own lives, which, by the way, I myself have done before back in my sports fan era. And let me tell you, it's exhausting to keep up with all the teams and players and points averages. Like, that takes some serious dedication. If any type of fan is going to be violent, it's going to be a male sports fan. Like all the England soccer fans who harassed three black players on the team, threatened them, were racist to them, all because England lost to Italy in the Euro 2020. Or it's the Lord of the Rings and Star Wars fans who threw a fit over characters of color in the newer movies and shows. None of these warrant a limited series exploring extreme fan behavior? Well, of course they don't. But neither does a fictional stan of fictional Beyonce being a murderer. The thing is, this show could have had the perfect context to explore those extreme fan cases in erotomania if they had just done more research and picked a topic or demographic worth dissecting. Maybe even an episodic show dealing with a different type of fan each week, I don't know. Like I saw online, there's a member of the Korean girl group twice who had this German stalker that wanted to be her boyfriend. This is a white man who showed up in Korea outside her apartment to give her a birthday present. Y'all don't think this demographic or story is worth dissecting? Girl groups actually have a lot of weirdo fans, especially the rookie teenage groups with grown-ass men obsessed with them. Like, that's not weird to y'all? But black female Beyonce fans are life-threatening? According to a member of our second triangle leg, Collider says the show nails the depiction of fandom, which is exactly what's wrong with this show. It perpetuates harmful stereotypes and classifications of female fandoms and instead allows people to feel righteous when they harass women for their interests. Are you a girl or woman who had worn a band t-shirt in public and gotten asked by grown men if you know any of their songs? That would have made way more sense as the premise of this show. One time I had a random stranger at the mall notice my Led Zeppelin t-shirt and act so genuinely confused that I listened to them. Like, duh, you think I would wear a basic black t-shirt with 11 red letters on it if I didn't like the band? Wouldn't the show make more sense if it was a guy going around killing teen girls who wore Nirvana shirts without knowing any Nirvana songs? Because that sort of harassment, though not on a murderous level, actually does happen. There's a weird phenomenon in media where y'all criticize the wrong things. I feel like creatives and execs in Hollywood just don't have the capacity to create a carefully nuanced examination of fandom from all sides. One of the most important missing aspects of nuance here is that a lot of the time, fans have to defend their favorite artists from genuine attacks, from other fandoms, from the media, the industry, and these attacks are typically misogynistic, racist, xenophobic, homophobic, etc. Like, I'm sure y'all saw everything that went down with Megan Thee Stallion, and it was her fans that stuck with her through all the harassment and hate she dealt with for two years. And not just her fans, but mostly female fans across all fandoms were defending her, while majority men and some pick-me-ass women were hating on her. I know Donald Glover is a musician too, but who gets on Twitter fighting in the name of Childish Gambino? Not to mention, he's been criticized of his portrayal of black women on Atlanta, as well as being offensive to black and Asian women in his songs. As for Janine Neighbors, she said she's not even on Twitter, so how could she possibly know anything about fan culture? I doubt anyone in the writer's room knows either, but regardless, it doesn't matter because the showrunners have the right to rewrite scripts uncredited and have the final say on all scripts. They're the ones who created and signed off on the stupid-ass premise where the main character goes around asking people their favorite artist and kills them if they don't like her fave. Like, who the hell came up with that? That's not how fan culture actually works. It's pretty much entirely online. Like, if someone tweeted they hate Beyonce, you and your followers would probably ratio them, report their tweet, and block them. If you want to talk about offline fan culture, there's conventions and concerts and meetups, and from what I've seen, 
Those are always pretty normal across any fandoms, except of course the grown men both in real life and online constantly threatening and harassing fandoms that they perceive to be full of teenage girls or young women, as well as such people in their own fan spaces. Turning the most often attacked demographic into the villain to critique something that doesn't actually happen is a very odd take. When you take something to such an extreme like in this show, it takes great finesse, and on top of that, the satire actually has to work content-wise. Murderous Beyonce fan is not satire, it's just some nonsense. One form of satire is the art of taking things to an extreme for the purpose of pointing out the truth and how people really do act like that, which is something they often use in Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but the satire attempt in this show just doesn't work. Regular old comedy would have been the best way to examine this fan culture stuff. I've always thought it would be interesting to have an animated comedy series, call it like Stantopia or something, and it would take place in a virtual manifestation of Stan Twitter and explore the positives and negatives of fandom and the different types of fandom. Then we could have a show that actually entertains and contributes to society. There's so much to explore, like stands of music, TV, movies, books, ships, sports, Twitter stands, Instagram stands, TikTok stands. A lot of the time, it's honestly unserious as hell. Like, I don't even watch Stranger Things, but I've seen those fans fight like hell over Malevin vs. Byler, which, if I got those correct, are ship names for teenage characters. Now, if the fan aspect of Swarm's premise wasn't already bad, it gets even worse. Once again, we have yet another serial killer with yet another damaging portrayal of trauma and mental illness as leading directly to murdering. Stop this. Just stop it. I'm tired. What is Hollywood's obsession with serial killers? What is the audience's obsession with serial killers and true crime and bad guys with traumatic backstories? It feels like these days people evaluate content on the basis of how dark it is. Not everything has to be dark and twisted. I feel like a lot of audiences have never experienced any darkness or danger in their actual lives, so to them it's like this commodity, like a haunted house or an amusement park. So they glorify content like this, and Hollywood keeps making it. Netflix put out a series about Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the many series and movies about famous serial killers, which, by the way, is another issue, because y'all are giving these brutal murderers this weird celebrity status. There's even Jeffrey Dahmer stan accounts. I'm not joking. This show was made despite the victim's family saying, no, we don't want a show about this man. Stop exploiting our family members and the cruelty and the pain we're dealing with. And yet, they put out the show anyway, and millions of people tuned in. If you've listened to my episode on you, or if you tune into my next episode, you'll know how I feel about the way serial killers are depicted on screen, and how the media has the power to influence audience perceptions and expectations. It's like this never-ending cycle. I once had a screenwriting class with a girl who wrote about a female serial killer, and she said, Women can be serial killers too and took great pride in the fact that she was writing about something she thought was groundbreaking. Like, sorry to say, but that's not exactly the female representation society needs. And in general, who needs to see so many serial killers? So many antiheroes? There's so many movies and shows about it. Why don't y'all like shows about normal people? Good people. Non-murdering people. You can do shows and movies about murder and killing and villains and all that, and those shows can still be really good and not damaging to society based on how you do them. The antihero was once a novelty on screen, but explored in interesting ways that tied in character and theme. It was a novelty to give the bad guy a backstory. Now, it's become the standard to have antiheroes and villains all have extremely tragic backstories that validate morally gray or villainous behavior. Not all bad guys need to be made sympathetic or redeemed, and even when you do, you have to do it in a way that doesn't make me roll my eyes. And stop making antiheroes like this. Wolverine was once considered an antihero. Not because he was a bad guy, but because he was a hero with very unhero like qualities. I feel like that definition now is just bad guys who are main characters. I think people have always incorrectly made the assumption that good guy versus bad guy stories don't have any depth to them. That's not the case at all, and when you start chasing this weird moral ambiguity, you forget that good guys are inherently flawed and bad guys are inherently human. Well told stories will have this sort of depth without you needing to invent crazy backstories to redeem the bad guy or make the good guy do super bad things or have some really sketchy background to make the bad guy seem more sympathetic or even relatable by comparison. Look at Lord of the Rings, there's a clear divide in the good versus bad for almost all the characters and the orcs are never redeemed or made sympathetic and neither are Sauron or Saruman and that's okay because that's not thematically necessary for the story. Of course, Swarm doesn't necessarily do all the stuff I just mentioned, but it does include the toxic combination of sad backstory and serial killing future. The show gives her some sad backstory on growing up in foster care or the foster system and some experience facing violence, but turning her into a murderer because of it? That's such an odd way to talk about these things. You know what, I actually hate this trend of trying to bring awareness to problems through extremely negative and unrealistic possibilities. Don't treat kids like crap because they might grow up to become murderers is not the thematic excellence they think it is. 
Why can't we have a story about kids going through tough stuff when they were young and growing into adults that were not murderers, but decent people, even if they had some bumps because there were people who helped them along the way, or they learned from their mistakes, or they just used common sense? Why can't we show that good example instead of creating some ridiculous fake example to once again use trauma and mental illness as backstory fodder? If you want to show that actually does a good job using the foster system and its impacts on kids as backstory, watch Once Upon a Time because that show does an incredible job showing how despite having a rough upbringing and going through really rough crap growing up, the main character doesn't turn evil. Sure, it makes her pretty jaded and it affects her trust, but with the love of newfound family and friends, she's able to break through that and be a hero and a savior. That's a much better depiction than this girl grew up in foster care and is now a serial killer, so beware all foster care workers and foster parents. Those kids might become serial killers if you don't treat them right. Like, that's not the message you should send. The message should instead be, hey, treat them right because it's the decent thing to do. We can even extend this to commentary on access to mental health care because what they do in this show and in movies like The Joker, they vaguely point out such issues and then make the main characters crazy murderers as a result. Like, why? Is there no better way to address these topics? I guess it's just too much to ask Hollywood to do more than just pretend to be woke. This show isn't an isolated instance in a sea of perfect content. It's a symptom of deep-rooted issues in Hollywood and this insulated world. There was this recent interview with actor Ben Barnes where he said, I keep asking my agents, I just want to do a rom-com, and then they're like, haven't got a rom-com but found this psychopath who's killing a lot of young people. Like, if this doesn't sum up the current problem with Hollywood, then I don't know what will. And it's y'all's fault too, like directly tuning into this content that y'all know is terrible and hate watching it anyway just to kill time, or being stupid enough to think it's good in the first place. Hollywood runs on a triangle and the audience is the last leg. So be smart, be vocal, and maybe that'll be enough to turn the tide away from garbage and towards good, enjoyable, non-harmful content. Thanks for listening. And once again, this was Trash Talk Reverse. Reverse.